Hey y'all, new day, new verses. We continue on into Jacob. Today we are doing chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. And I want to get into it, so let's just have some fun with it. Go ahead. Verse 2. For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? And again, this entire section can and should be read together as well thing I wanted to point on here, because you really can break this down verse by verse. An example I wanted to give with these verses though, is something I saw happen in a church I used to attend. A politician of some renown for the state came in and decided to take part of a service. This is a person that I had not seen hide nor hair of in the building ever, and I had been going for several years. When this politician came in, they made arrangements so that only their security was allowed to do anything, and they were put front and center in front of everybody, put right up there next to the pastors, in fact. Whereas the normal people who were attending constantly were asked to go in the back for whatever reason. You know, be it because, oh, we need room for their security too, or, well, we know you don't particularly like this politician, and so we want you to go into the back of the building. And my heart rended when I saw this, and it was a reason that a lot of people ended up heading out to different places, but God using all things for his glory and the good of those who love him, much blessing has come out of the event. The initial event, though, it saddened me because it went from a place of, you know, a hospital where people are coming to receive the word for the Holy Spirit to move in and to just fill, you know, of that place where we're supposed to come together, what a church is supposed to look like. And it became one that saddened me. It became a place where it was evident that prestige and you know, doing the rounds as far as the politician was concerned to, you know, oh, well, see, I've been seen here, so I'm part of the common people. And it just, it felt so fake to me. Not just on the politician's level, but on the church's level. Because it's like, oh, I've never seen this person in here at all. And, um, you don't get private security in a church. <laughs> if the church has people there just to make sure everybody's doing okay, ushers and stuff like that, that's enough. It's a house of God. So bringing in your own security force and saying, well, everybody has to go here, 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 and you have to do it our way because we said so, I don't want you in my church. At least not a physical building like that, because it's trying to put yourself up over somebody. What the politician did and what the pastor of that church allowed to happen in that moment was accepting the world to come in in a place where it's the Holy Spirit is supposed to be in charge. And it, it, it saddened me because I saw such a shift in so many of the people who went there. You know, not just because they may have disagreed or agreed with the politician standing, but the fact that for that one visit, the entire church was thrown into a way. Everything about it was thrown off, so nobody could get into where they were comfortable or places where they could truly worship because they were constantly being distracted by the noise of the world. You know, there was behavior that I completely understand when Paul's like, well, I don't give permission for these women to be over the church because they were doing the same thing this politician was doing, making it about themselves. You know, and admittedly, that is how I read Paul. I don't read it as the no women are allowed to have authority because Genesis 1-1 says man and woman, he created them in his image, which means men and women both are image bearers. And in its truest form, we stand alongside each other more complementarianism if you have to put a label on it, which, ugh. It always seemed absurd to me that if both are created in his image, then one lording over the other is a fulfillment of what the word said would happen doesn't make it a good thing. And when you look at how Jesus talks about how marriage is supposed to look, and even Paul talks about how it's supposed to be this place of being supplicant to each other, looking after each other, that it is a family unit of everybody coming before the Lord and saying, He is king, so that we are not, you know, I'm king of the castle. Then you have a broken castle, because God should be the king of your castle. Even David was known as a prince, and he was king over all of Israel. All twelve tribes. And he referred to himself as a prince. 
because only God is king. And when I see things like this, when I see those evil motives come out of looking like, oh, hey, well, we want to make sure that the politician is seen with common people, uh, then you're an oligarch. You're not a leader. And I, I will admit wholeheartedly that my background is one from, you know, all men are created equal, all mankind is created equal, that they are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Personally, I think that should be the pursuit of God, because He is the source of joy. It still staggers me, though, and rends my heart that we will have these places where people will beat each other down because, oh, well, this, or what about, okay, what about Deborah? How about Esther? Ruth, maybe? some amazing women in the Word, and most of them, believe it or not, were not Jewish by blood. So when I hear these arguments that, bit, you know, divide by this or that or the other, I roll my eyes. Because it seems like one of those evil motives. This place of, you know, oh, well, we're going to give special treatment for the rich. We're going to give special treatment for the people who could put our name on the map. Isn't God the one who does that? Isn't God the one who lifts up the name? Isn't God the one who gives sight to the blind, who makes the mouth speak, who makes the lame walk, who makes the dead rise? God is the one who does that. So saying, oh, well, I'm going to give them special treatment because they can help with this, or I'm going to give them lesser treatment because they can't help with that. You're displaying evil motives. Because at that point, your entire place of motivation is what can I get out of it. And if the entire place of motivation is what can I get out of it, it's narcissism. It's supposed to be other-centric love, not how can they help me. If you're saying how can they help me, you, you really have to check the spirit on it. Because if it's a community place of, well, God said I should ask this person for help, then ask for help. Help is good. Help is a gift. When it comes to a place of I'm going to use them, that's different. That's evil. That's sin. Because when you use each other, <laughs> key word, it's the same kind of imagery as when they violently take all the way through Genesis. It's this place of saying, well, I want it my way, so I'm going to make sure it happens one way or the other. And it's something that often gets done by these places where somebody with expensive jewelry or fine clothing or, oh, they've got all these, they've got all these aspects about them that could make us on the map, make us look beautiful, do something for us. But the poor person, the one in need, we're not going to help them. Because this isn't just on a church level of, you know, pastors welcoming politicians that cause division in the church. This is straight up down to places where, oh, well, I, I want to make sure that I get ahead. I want to make sure that I have enough. Then you don't serve Jaira, because he is the God of more than enough. No, I mean, seriously, it's, it's a humanly sin. It's a world way of looking at it. It's going, oh, these are the mass, uh, as loves here, hierarchy of needs. I need to make sure I have this, 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 and this. And God's saying, no, well, but the character. How about you have a character that is so trusting of the Lord that the rest of those hierarchy of needs are trusted that God will see to it? Because most of those needs are what keeps us in shallow places. You know, well, I, I have to have food to eat. Does God not provide the food? Well, I need water. Does God not provide the water? Well, I need shelter. Does God not provide it? I, I mean, tabernacles is a feast for a reason. Because God constantly, again and again and again and again and again, comes in and provides and does amazingly. And I'm kind of picking up on verse 5 here where it says, Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? So this world is creating a place where we will cast down those who God sees as most important and raise up those who are more interested in raising up themselves. And we create this place where no other graven images, and yet we're saying this online personality or this athlete or what have you is the graven image that becomes worshipped. You know, oh, I want to be like Mike. Which part? The gambling addiction? Potential drug issue? Like, which part? Which part do you want to be? I, I want to be like God because I know people are broken. And I don't want the baggage that comes with that path they had to take. So when I hear the song Faith Like Daniel and you know on Lions Den, like Moses in the wilderness, a heart like David, that term like, 
because I want to go deeper than just those places. I want to be in such an intimate place that the rest of it doesn't matter because it's about the relationship with God. You know, the poor in this world are the ones that God sees and looks after. Because in those poor states, you learn where your help comes from. It doesn't come from the hills. It doesn't come from a politician. It doesn't come from the affluent. Generally, all three don't give a damn because they're either inert in one form or another or simply refuse to. Can't. God is the source of our hope. God is the source of our help. God is the source of all things in regards to life. <laughs> Keeping in mind that, oh, you know, what we've talked about earlier. You know, because if it is a good and perfect gift coming from God the Father, yea, everything else an opportunity for endurance is God gives us the grace to make it through. You know, this entire book, and seriously, go ahead and read it. If you would like, get back to me. Let's have a deep conversation on these things. Because reading this book, it is heavy, it is intimate, and it is beautiful. And it points out all too often what we will do the silliest of worldly things. You know? Oh, well, the rich can help me out, and I can do this in the world, and I can do this in the world, I can do this in the world. Why not just take the desires of your heart, place them before God, and do what he says to do so that what is actually meant to be done can be fulfilled? All of this becomes, or is needed, to be a personal, intimate relationship, where everything has to be laid at the foot of the cross. And I mean everything. The hopes, the joys, the hurt, and the help. All of it has to be laid before him. Because if we're taking and holding anything back, we create this place of divided loyalty. I mean, I love reading what Eliyahu says to the people of Israel before the showdown of prophets when he says, you know, why are you picking one, why are you flip-flopping? If Yahweh is your God, follow him. If he's not, follow the other one. But pick. It's like we were talking about yesterday because it is this beautiful place of pick. Do you want Yahweh to be your God? Then lay down the crap that's not of you. Pick up your cross and follow him so that you can understand what is written in this love letter. This place where God sees the broken and the hurt and the corruption and the damage and the fact that we are all compromised people and that he moves in and helps us and renews us and makes us alive. That his breath, his Holy Spirit is rock in us, making us alive so we can be real image bearers. Because I don't know about you, and I am really tired of existing alongside these places that pretend to be human. You know, how long do we have to live in a world that human and humane are completely different ideas? Especially since one was derived from the other. If we are not living humanely, why would we expect to be considered human? Because one word came from the other. And I'd really, really want to see all creation cry out to the one who was and is and is to come before he shows up so that the option is taken away and come to call on him as king. Because our way of doing it has never worked. It will never work. It can never work. I offer all of human history as my argument where humanity tries to create this hierarchical system of those on top and those on bottom. That's not how it works. And in the word of God, we are called to break those divisions so that all are equal before the king. Because he sees us. God is no respecter of persons. If he's no respecter of persons, then wouldn't we all be on the same level of needing grace and grace abundantly because we are broken sinners in need of our Savior? Wouldn't we need to cry out to the Lord all equally because we are all equally lost? You know, Jacob will talk a little later on and we'll get into about the whole, the same God who says, you know, love your neighbor is the same God who says, you know, don't commit adultery and don't commit murder. If you've committed adultery, you've broken the law, same as if you had murdered. Because it may not be the same semantic part of the law, but it's the part of the law, period. Why, when Jesus adds to it of the whole, I say to you, if you are even angry at your brother, that you are guilty of murder. Lust after your neighbor, you are an adulterer. Lust after these idols, and you do the same. When you lust after the way the world does it and say, well, I, I want it to look like that. I want it to look like the world does it. I want to have stuff, lots of stuff and lots of money and crap that will never provide. 
It's just crap. What will the loot do for you? Will it give you strength in your weakness? Will it give you hope in your sorrow? Will it give you joy when there is nothing left? Or, because the world give it, gave it and can easily take it away, will it leave you wanting, bereft, and in whole of sorrow and depression and as it leaves so many who rely on their wealth? We're not supposed to judge the way the world does. The world lifts up those who can help them. Because... Well, I want to get mine, and if I do a little bit of good to them, then they owe me. Okay, so this says give without expecting anything in return. This says if somebody demands the coat off your back, or the shirt off your back, give them your cloak as well. This says when somebody betrays you and slaps you in the face, you are to turn the cheek and forgive 70 times 7. And I'm not talking pacifism here. I'm talking true devotion to God that makes it so the rest of it doesn't matter. So that when we get to those places, as an extreme example, where people are trying to stone us to death, as Stephen was, one of the first martyrs in, in the New Testament, instead of ripping into them a new one, or calling down any of these things, or behaving the world does, he gives a speech about the fact that this is the way the world has always done it. It calls evil good and good evil. It kills good, then parades it around, and then says, oh, well, we wouldn't have done what they did. We wouldn't have killed the good person. You're killing the good people now. So you would. This is about heart. This is about character on an intimate level. This is something about far deeper than we understand or really have a word for the West. It's about your whole nephish. Your lev, your nefesh, your ma'od. This is about all of you so that you can truly shema. This is about your whole being in utter devotion to the Lord so that you can truly live. That you can truly be alive. Because the evil motives say, I want to get mine before, well, the getting's good. Good motives say, I want to do what God says for me to do because it's His will, not mine, that I want done. Personally, Speaking for myself, same kind of expression, but being forward here, I used to have those places. Well, I, I, I know where, where I speak from this thing because I used to be in those wandering places. I used to be in those places where it's like, well, well, money just makes the world go round. Except it doesn't. It never has. The world may use money as a currency, and it may use it to exchange Horrible things, from resources to lives. And it doesn't make the world go round. It's the language the world speaks, and that is why God speaks so often in here with tithe and places like that of trying to speak another language, a different one. So that concerns of money can be done away with. Because, well, what power does the thing have? Well, it can make your life easier. No, it can't. No, it can't. Been on the affluent side of things, too. Generally, money makes your life more difficult. Because in the fear of losing it, you do horrible things to try and keep it. It's statistically how it goes. It's the history of it. And when we play in this worldly game of wanting to keep hold of the money, we show those evil motives. When we want to put the poor person, the needy person, the orphan, the widow, the immigrant, out of sight, out of mind, make them lesser because, well, they're just going to die anyway, so we don't exactly need them. We'll just push them over here and wait for them to die. People on poor insurances or ones who have very little help, getting screwed over by systems that want to get rid of them and push them away. And admittedly, when I read verses like this and I think about the fact that God does hand over nations to the consequences of their actions, see all of Old Testament, I shudder and have filled with sorrow because if a nation is judged based on how it treats the least of these, the orphan, the widow, the immigrant, those in need, um, we're screwed in the West. Hook, line, and sinker. Because we have entire strips and streets and blocks, alphabet cities, where we put away those in need 
slums where we make sure that those who don't have enough are just kept out of way, Skid Row in California covering a massive amount of area, having a population of it that rivals some small states, and we do nothing? Oh, oh God will not allow injustice like that to pass for long. We shouldn't either. We shouldn't be rejoicing when those who are in need get cast out. As I'm reminded of what God says in Exodus to the people as he brings them out. You were immigrants once, so you don't get to treat them poorly. You were slaves once, so you don't get to do that crap. You were orphans once, and you have been rescued. Every single time God looks after those who are in need, God looks after the poor because he wants the poor in spirit to come rest in him. And this is where you can see the difference between having, because it's the poor in spirit. If you're obsessed with your wealth to the point where you've made it an idol, you're already worshiping a false god. If you're struggling with the Lord and happen to have money, then give it over to him. And I don't mean that whole televangelist TV crap, oh, give me money and God will give you... No. I mean use the resources you have the way God wants you to use them. If you're good at managing a business, ask God where he wants you to do so. If you're good at talking, show him where he wants to live your life. If you're good at moving things. If you're good at thinking different things. Use your muchness to worship the Lord. Because when we put up these people who are affluent but poor in spirit and broken and create idols out of them because they have what we wish we had, we show our evil intentions. We show our motivation is not about an intimate relationship with God who makes us well. It shows that our intentions in that moment is about having stuff. Stuff will not help you. Stuff does not care. And the rabble will always lead you astray. It's rabble. The need is to rest in Him. When you get distracted by the waves and you get distracted by the shiny, when you get distracted of these things of the world, we forget those who need it most, those who need to be uplifted, those who need the hope, those who need to be reminded that God will see to it. Those who are struggling and say, well, God gave me this and said that you need this, so here. Well, well you need it? Apparently not if God said to give it. He's the one who sees to every need. His name is Jaira. So if he said, do this, I shall go do. It's a place of relational trust and belief that he will see to every one of those needs. Because when we lift up those who are in fancy dress and cast out those who are in dirty clothes, we show that Jesus probably wouldn't be welcome in our church. Because he didn't have anywhere to lay his head. Jesus was on this world homeless. His real home, our real home, the kingdom of heaven, that is what he was bringing. That's what he brought. The kingdom of heaven is near. We get to live in that place. Even before a kingdom come, we can live in that place of pure restful joy distinct and set apart, because we live distinct and set apart. In trust. Not believing that it is the Word that will make us holy. Believing that it is the Word who will make us holy. The Word made flesh. The one whose spirit speaks through the rhema word so that the Bible reads us, rather than us just reading it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they should be called children of God. Peacemakers. I mean, it's right there all the way through the beauty of Matthew, isn't it? Blessed are those who pour and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing what's right, 
for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. He's not stuttering. He's being very forward when he puts it so wonderfully that it's about those relationship places. Because God is the one who makes us those things. Otherwise, we, could, we would follow the way of the world. Which, if you're not seeing it now, be glad God has put a block in front of you and a hedge of protection to keep you off of social media. And if you see what I'm talking about, then please join me in turning to the Lord. Because He's the only one who will set right what we are in desperately needing to be fixed. Us. Because the world will be done away with when the, king, when the king comes. Until that moment, we need the kingdom in here fixed so that we're not picking between two idols. We're not wrestling with divided loyalties. We're not putting up the rich here and casting down the poor here. We are staying in utter truth and devotion to the fact that God sees it so that our motivations are about building the kingdom Going forth from Judea at Samaria and the ends of the earth, making disciples of all the nations. Chasing after the one true God who was and is and is to come. The only way to the Father through the blood of the Son. We need to actually dig into what it looks like to be set different. And we need to start living lives all of us, and I'm not, kind of like myself included, I'm not pointing at feeding, and I'm saying what we should want to do. Not because of a twisted arm or a, a, a pointed sword or anything else like that. Simply because the conviction of the Lord changes our heart and puts in us a spirit that says, no, I need to do different. Because we are different. And we are no longer our own. When we are bought by the blood of the Lamb. Back to verse 1. A slave, a bondservant. We are His. And our lives should hopefully look it. So that we do not wrestle with the things of this world. Rather we take them and put them before the throne. We let Him wrestle everything out of us. Take it out of us. So that it's not a fight. It's a place of surrender so that we can truly live. So who do you favor? The affluent, the rich, those who can help you get ahead? Or do you favor those who can offer you nothing but still need a hand? As personally, I say favor neither. Love them both equally. And remember that circumstances are an opportunity for God to work things. Is We don't have to favor some over others. We can love all people equally because we are all in desperate need of Him. To me, maybe that's a step in the right direction. I'd like to know what you think. Let's have a chat about it, because the conversation is more enjoyable than just talking at a camera. I'll see you guys, God willing, tomorrow as we continue on re-hitting on five and moving through to eight. We will play it by ear, because God is the one in control. God is the one in charge. And we get to be with Him in this beautiful place. I'll see you then.